Good morning, Amazing Grace, and welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday in the season of Advent. We are so grateful to be able to still come together and worship, even though we're not in person this morning. Uh, we're busily preparing for Christmas Eve worship at 4.30 and 6.30 p.m. Uh, a quick note about today, uh, the order of worship, a kind of bulletin, is posted uh, on our uh, Facebook page and should have gone out also uh, in a link with this uh, video recording that's been passed around. Um, so uh, you can find and follow along with the worship service uh, on that Google document. Uh, and uh, if you would prefer not to, that's absolutely fine too. You can simply come along for the ride. We begin this fourth Sunday of Advent by lighting our Advent wreath. Praise to you, O God, who lives with us, sharing our flesh and our bones. As Mary waited and Joseph dreamed, so we dream and wait for you. Bless us, and let your face shine upon us, more radiant than these candles, and more dear than all else we seek. Restore us when we fail to refuse the evil and choose the good, and banish all our fears. We pray in the name of Emmanuel, your promised child and our Savior. Amen. Listen now, the heavens start to whisper in reply. We sing together the song, Now the Heavens Start to Whisper.
We join together now in our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who opens the heavens and who draws near to us with salvation. Amen. God is patient and merciful, desiring all to come to repentance. Trusting in this promise, let us confess our sin. Everlasting God, you love justice and hate wrongdoing. We confess the fear, greed, and self-centeredness that make us reluctant to work against oppression. We are complicit in systems of exploitation. We choose comfort over courage. We are careless with creation's bounty. So look upon us with mercy. Turn our hearts again to you. Make us glad to do your will and walk in your ways for the sake of our waiting world. Amen. Family of God, hear these words of assurance. God clothes you with garments of salvation and covers you with robes of righteousness. In the tender compassion of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. God's covenant is eternal, and God's blessing rests upon us all. Amen. We'll now sing our next hymn, Love Has Come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. With your abundant grace and might, free us from the sin that would obstruct your mercy, that willingly we may bear your redeeming love to all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Psalms, the 89th chapter. Your love, O Lord, forever will I sing. From age to age, my mouth will proclaim your faithfulness. For I am persuaded that your steadfast love is established forever. You have set your faithfulness firmly in the heavens. 
I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn an oath to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and preserve your throne for all generations. You spoke once in a vision and said to your faithful people, I have set the crown upon a warrior and have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David, my servant, and preserve your throne for all generations. I have found David, my servant, with holy oil have I anointed him. My hand will hold him fast, and my arm will make him strong. No enemy shall deceive him, nor shall the wicked bring him down. I will crush his foes before him and strike down all those who hate him. My faithfulness and steadfast love are with him, and he shall be victorious through my name. I will set his hand on the sea and his right hand on the rivers. He will say to me, you are my father, my God, the rock of my salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia. Now the heavens start to whisper as the veil is growing thin. Earth from slumber wakes to listen to the stirring faint within. Child who comes to grace the manger, teach our hearts to welcome you in. Alleluia. Alleluia. The good news comes to us today from the first chapter of the Gospel according to St. Luke. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean country, to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said in reply, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For God has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is God's name. God's mercy is for those who fear God from generation to generation. God has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. God has filled the hungry with good things and set the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, according to the promise that he made to our ancestors, to Abraham and to his descendants forever. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I want to begin our brief reflection today by showing you a picture. This is a, a wood block print that hangs in my office right above my desk. If you've been in there before, I'm sure you've seen it uh, hanging there. Take a moment to just look at it there. It's a wood block print by the artist Ben Wildflower from the East Coast of the United States. On it, we have Mary with her fist raised in the air, her boot upon a snake and a skull, in it, it quotes the passage that we've just read, the Magnificat of Mary. It says, cast down the mighty, send the rich away, fill the hungry, and lift the lowly. Now I want you to take a moment to reflect for yourself. Maybe you can chat with the person sitting in your home there with you watching this. What do you think of that? That image of Mary? Is it similar to or different from other images of Mary that you have typically seen out in the world? I would argue that this image of Mary that we have from the artist Ben Wildflower looks a little different than how Mary is typically depicted in popular culture and media, and even typically depicted within the church. We don't often see Mary as a person with her own autonomy, but we see her often only through her relationship with her son, Jesus. Which, of course, is understandable. Jesus, the Savior, is worth us paying attention to. And yet, 
I think it's important for us to consider what Mary might be like on her own. You see, because Jesus was certainly influenced by her as he grew up in her home. I want you to hear, once again, some of the words from Mary's great song or poem, the one that we call the Magnificat. She says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For God has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely from now on all generations will call me blessed. And why? Because God is doing something through Mary. She says this, For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is God's name. God's mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He's shown strength with his arm. How? Well, God has scattered the proud, the conceited in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones and lifted up the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. God has remembered God's people and the promises that God made to our ancestors. The words that Mary speaks in this passage are truthfully pretty radical. It makes sense to me, actually, to depict Mary in the way that Ben Wildflower did, with her fist in the air, standing with her boot upon a snake. And I'm not the only one, nor Ben Wildflower, the only ones who have noticed that Mary has this kind of radical edge to her. In fact, it's been a common practice in the West to ban the Magnificat in certain oppressive situations. In the 1970s, the government of Argentina banned all public recitation of this passage after the mothers of the Plaza de Mayo, uh, whose children had been disappeared, published it as their manifesto of nonviolent resistance to the ruling military junta. Later, Guatemala did the same thing in the 1980s. And generations before that, British authorities in the East India Company excised this reading from the evening prayers, not wanting people to have access to its revolutionary edge. Mary's fiery speech at the beginning of Luke's Gospel may be the appointed canticle for Vespers, but it has also emboldened people who have been colonized and oppressed to resist their oppressors. It has been used by the traumatized poor to claim for themselves God's preferential love. And now, where this passage wasn't formally banned in the world, I would argue that it was effectively banned. It may as well have been banned. I mean, it's not a passage that I particularly heard very often growing up in the Lutheran Church. You see, where this passage wasn't formally banned, authoritative church and state powers who did so, Those with the most stake in fighting against any equalizing justice that would threaten the status quo, instead of just banning it, often domesticated the message by spiritualizing it. Mary must be talking about some abstract heavenly reality and not about the ways in which God desires to change the world here and now, to turn it on its head, to flip it, some might argue, right side up. Or, in the churches that I grew up in, in Protestant churches, we have essentially banned this by domesticating Mary, by pushing her to the margins of the story. She's barely a character. You know, there's that old fear that will sound too Catholic if we commit too much attention to Mary. The Virgin Mary of sentimental Christianity This is the one that we all know well. But Miriam of the Jewish peasantry, who gives her voice to people longing for liberation, we don't know her so much. Yet, I think it's worth paying attention to this Mary. You see, because if we read a little further on in the Gospel of Luke, we can see her own revolutionary edge being echoed through the voice of Jesus. Jesus, who himself in the Gospel of Luke has this mission of flipping the world on its head, subverting the status quo, changing life, especially for those who have found themselves poor and oppressed. Maybe Jesus learned a lot more from Mary than we often give her credit for. I mean, listen to what he says in Luke chapter 4. This is his inaugural address. 
He stands up before his home synagogue and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, quoting from the prophet. The spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring good news to the poor. God has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim the year of Jubilee, the year when all debts are meant to be forgiven. We read on a little further, and after Jesus spends some time hanging out with all the wrong kinds of people, tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, those who the righteous would never touch with a ten-foot pole, Jesus engages in a longer teaching session. And he kicks off this long teaching. In Luke, we call it the Sermon on the Plain. He kicks off this long teaching by saying this, Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are the mourning. Blessed are the persecuted. But woe to those who are rich. Woe to those who are full. And woe to those who are well regarded. And this is all even before Jesus gets into his parables, which expose the brokenness of our world and the way that people often get trampled within it. Now, I would say it makes sense that Mary sings this song. We get a fuller appreciation of her song when we consider the context that she comes from. You see, we believe through historical dating, through biblical scholarship, and some other things, that Jesus was probably born between the years 6 and 4 BC. We know this because of who is ruling at the time and who the Gospels identify as ruling at the time. So if this is around the year 6 to 4 BC, Mary and her compatriots would have fresh in their memory recent tensions, recent atrocities committed by the occupying Roman Empire. You see, in the year 4 BCE, the year perhaps that Jesus was born, when Herod the Great died, Jews rebelled all over the land. The Romans then directed the Syrian legion to come and crush the Jewish rebellions. So they went and they burned the city of Sepphoris in Galilee to the ground, and they reduced its inhabitants to slavery. Sepphoris might not be a familiar name, in part because it was destroyed. And you might not also know that Nazareth, Mary's hometown, Jesus' hometown, is only four miles from Sepphoris. They would have known and understood atrocities, the same that people in places like Gaza and Ukraine know today. So here we have Mary in kind of an ordinary city, but in the midst of great political turmoil and violence. And Mary herself, even within that structure and system, is a person who doesn't have access to much power, who would find herself among the poor and lowly. We know of Mary that she is a peasant girl of marriageable age. This would probably make her a young woman or a teenager even. We know that Mary becomes pregnant before her marriage is finalized. In the Gospel of Matthew, in fact, her soon-to-be husband Joseph even considers how he might quietly dismiss her because of this scandal. In the eyes of the theologian Justo Gonzalez, To the eyes of the world, Mary will bear the stigma of an unwed mother. And how do you think Mary would have been treated if she went around later and told folks that it was in fact not Joseph or any other man, but the Holy Spirit that had caused her to conceive out of wedlock? Now the people of Israel heard old, old stories of God opening the wombs of barren women. We even saw it in Mary's uh, relative Elizabeth. Those were more familiar stories. But impregnating an unmarried teenager, that's something pretty new. It's this girl, in the midst of this political crisis and violence, who greets Elizabeth. The joy that she experiences, the joy that Elizabeth experiences with the baby even leaping in her womb, The Spirit enables Elizabeth to look beyond the social stigma of God, to see God at work in and through Mary. Maybe this great welcome also has to do with her own situation in life. You see, 
Elizabeth herself probably experienced some social stigma because of her barrenness. Elizabeth knows from her own experience the cost of being shamed and excluded. In greeting Mary with joy, Elizabeth overturned social expectations. A righteous person would keep such a sinner at bay, but Elizabeth greets her with open arms, knowing that God is doing something different, something new, here and now, in this very odd location of an unwed teenage mother in the midst of a huge political crisis. Not only this, but Elizabeth calls Mary blessed. This isn't only because she's bearing the Christ child, but as Elizabeth said, because Mary trusted in God's promises to her. She believed that God might be able to actually use her and her situation to bring about salvation in the world. And so the two women, when they meet each other, cannot help but shout and sing. My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Mary's song is a call for God's people to commit ourselves to the kind of compassion that Jesus has, the kind of compassion that flips the world on its head. And even though it talks about bringing the rich down and sending the rich away, bringing the powerful down and sending the rich away, filling the hungry with good things, it's not only about liberation for the poor. You see, because the rich need liberation too. This is a liberation from our tendency to be so self-involved and curved in on ourselves. So we can all hear Mary's story of, uh, as good news for a world in need of a new order. Mary in this passage is not just singing about getting to heaven when we die. No, this is about lives and communities transformed here and now by the grace and love of Jesus. It's about all people receiving the same radical message and being set free from whatever oppresses us. We need this good news of a different kind of world, one not marked by violence but by compassion, one marked by an equalizing justice. We need this in Gaza. We need this in Ukraine and Russia. We need this as we combat against the powers of racism and white supremacy, as we combat the violence that tears children from us, as we live in the midst of an ecological crisis, as we see sin and brokenness in our world. We need this good news. God has something else in mind. So today... Today, on this fourth Sunday of Advent, we prepare our hearts to receive Jesus Christ, this revolutionary Lord who flips the world on its head, of whom Mary sings, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. May this world change, and may God use you to bring about God's vision of a peaceful and compassionate world. Amen. This next hymn might be unfamiliar to some folks. The tune should be familiar, but the words come directly from this first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. It quotes from Mary's Magnificat. The song is called, My Soul Proclaims Your Greatness. My soul proclaims your greatness, Lord, I sing my Savior's praise. You looked upon my lowliness, and I am full of praise. Now every land and every age this blessing shall proclaim. Great wonders you have done for me, and Yes. 
beside the lowly throne instead. The hungry filled with all good things, the rich sent off unfed. To Israel, your servant blessed, your help is ever sure. The promise to our parents made their children. I encourage you in this time of watchful waiting to pause this video and take a few brief moments of silence. Listen to the presence of God that comes to us so frequently in a whisper. Living together in trust and hope, let us now confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, with hope and expectation, we offer our prayers for the Church, the world, and all who await God's day of restoration. God, you promised mercy to Abraham and Sarah and their descendants forever. Bring your church into thoughtful, caring, and collaborative relationship with those of other faiths. Strengthen our shared values that we might work together in caring for our common world. Merciful God, receive our prayer. As fields and crops lie dormant, bless them with holy rest. Prepare them to thrive that they provide abundant food in due season. Protect animals who hibernate and provide all who scavenge for food in the lean season. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You raise up the lowly and cast down the arrogant. Teach humility to all in positions of authority. Break down all systems of oppression, especially systems that perpetuate inequity and exclusion. Do not allow wealth, power, or pride to become idols that obscure your call to justice. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Look with favor upon all who cry out to you. Accompany with tenderness all who are afraid or ill, especially those whom we name before you now. Rescue all who experience abuse or who live under the threat of violence especially refugees, immigrants, and asylum seekers in search of a safe and stable home. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Lord, you are pleased to make your home among us. Make our homecomings joyful as we gather with friends, family, and chosen families in celebration this day. Grant safety to all who travel and sustain the work of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services and other ministries that assist in setting up new homes for people. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We pray this day also for our brothers and sisters who, and other siblings who find themselves in the midst of strife or warfare, especially the people of Gaza and Israel, the people of Ukraine and Russia, the people of Ethiopia, Sudan, and Afghanistan, and the people in our own country charged with making important decisions. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Blessed are you for Mary and all your servants in every generation who have lived according to your promise of mercy. 
Strengthen us by their example until the revelation of your glory is made known to all. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Listen to these and all our prayers, O God of hosts, and restore us with your great and everlasting mercy. Amen. And now, Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sin as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now, my siblings in Christ, receive this blessing, this benediction. May the God of peace bless you. The love of Christ sustain you in hope, and the anointing of the Spirit remain upon you, now and forever. Amen. Our final song today is hopefully a familiar one, Joy to the World. Thanks be to God. Amen.